Praise the Lord. Rise up as we pray together, preparing our hearts for the Bible study tonight. You want to tell the Lord that the Lord will bless your coming to the Bible study tonight. Open the pages of the scriptures to you. Explain, apply, illustrate, instruct from the word of God as we learn together tonight. Open your mouth and talk to the Lord in prayer. That the Lord himself will favor you. Or the teaching, revelation of his word. Now God will grant you the spirit of understanding. Make you a stable believer, steadfast in the Lord. A soul winning Christian by your life, by your commitment, leading others to know the Lord every moment of your life, every day of your life, living a life that is pleasing to Him, a heart and mind. That wants to glorify God alone, wanting to exalt his name. A life devoted, dedicated to spreading the gospel. Reaching out to people around you. With the good news of the death of Christ, his burial and resurrection. For the salvation of the whole of humanity. Pray that the word of God will fall into fertile ground in your heart. That will profit from the teaching of the word. To strengthen you, energize you, empower you. To stand firm in this word of God in these last days. The word of his grace will build you up. Straighten you out. Cleanse you, purge you, purify you. Cut off, chisel out all those rough edges in your life. That your life will become beautiful. For the Lord, that the grace of God will so work in your life that those who see you and know you will know that the hand of the Lord has done something, something marvelously gracious in your life. Pray that your heart will accept the truth and reject error and falsehood. The saving grace of God and the sanctifying grace of God, the sustaining grace of God will keep you and hold you up. In times of temptations, of trials, of troubles, that God will also help you to keep standing on the rock of ages, not drifting, not sliding back, But remaining steadfast and stable, immovable. 
while the winds of life are blowing, you remain firm on a solid rock. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for a great opportunity you've given us to fellowship together around your table and to drink and to take and to eat of this bread of life. Lord, we pray that you give us this solid food of the spiritual life so that we'll be able to grow thereby in Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, that you help us not to feed on error or falsehood, deception or lies. But, Lord, we'll feed on this, the same milk of the word of God that we may grow thereby. And we pray, Lord, that you grant us real balanced spiritual growth in Jesus' name. And as we grow in the knowledge of your salvation, we'll also grow in the life of the Christian, of the believer, in Jesus' name. And Lord, we pray your grace will be so visible, manifest in our lives that others around us will see the grace and the growth and the godliness that you have given us. That Lord, your glory will be upon your people in Jesus' name. Lord, as we learn about the Thessalonian church, we pray this church and all our members, young and old men and women, will be like this church in Jesus' name. A church saved, sanctified, spirit-filled, waiting for the coming of the Lord, living a rapturable life. Grant us such a life and such a church in Jesus' name. Make each of our lives glorious and the church glorious, without spot, without sin, without wrinkle, without any blemish. Do it for us, Lord, that our lives will bring great glory unto you. Edification to the church, you keep us to evangelize the world around us. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you very much. You can sit down. We're looking at First Thessalonians chapter 1. We started last week and this week we come to study number 2. And we're still looking at verse 1. Look at First Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 1. Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus. That Silvanus means Silas. And Timotheus, of course, is Timothy. Unto the church of the Thessalonians, which is in God the Father. And in the Lord Jesus Christ, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. As you look at that opening verse of the epistle, it reveals that it was written to the church of the Thessalonians. Look at that again. Paul, Silas, Timothy, unto the church of the Thessalonians. But he tells us about that church. And he tells us it's a church in God the Father. In God the Father means it's like the church is dwelling in God and God dwelling in them. And also in Christ Jesus in the Lord. That means that they're dwelling in the Lord and the Lord also dwelling in them. Their life hid with Christ in God. A life that is saved. A life that is purified. A life that is cleansed. A life that is yielded unto the Lord. That the Lord can receive them as the Lord had said. Come out from among them. And be separate, says the Lord. And I will receive you. I'll be a father unto you. And ye shall be my sons. And my daughter, says the Lord. These have repented of their sins. They have turned away from their evil. And then they became the children of God. And God was pleased to dwell in them. And he allowed them to dwell dwell in him. By the way, that word church has come across. The word church in the New Testament, it means actually in the Greek ecclesia. 
and it's from the verb it means is ek kaleo and ek kaleo means the called out ones a true church is an assembly or congregation of the called out ones they were called out of their sins called out of the world called out of the deeds of the flesh called out of darkness but not just called out or you come out of somewhere you come into another it's like when you are going out of your house when you go out of the house you're coming into an office a school a company a corporation or somewhere you come out so that you can come in you come out of somewhere so that you can come into another place that's why it says they came out out of the world they came to the lord and they came out of their sin they came into the savior they came out of darkness they came into the light they came out of the deeds of the flesh and they came into the fruit of the spirit look at that again it says paul and sylvanus and timotheus unto the church of the thessalonians which is in god they came out of everything that was wrong, everything deadly and everything deluding, uh, deluding. And then they came into God and they came into Christ. These called out ones, that's what you call a true church. They were sinners in the world before the gospel came to them. When the gospel came to them, there is one word that is used for them in verse 9. Look at verse 9 of chapter 1. For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we add unto you. And how ye turned, that's the word, ye turned, ye turned to God from idols to serve the living and the true God. They turned away from their idol worship. They turned away from everything defiling, everything deluding, everything that was dangerous to their spiritual life. They came out of that and then they came into the Lord himself. That word turn that shows the very purpose why Jesus came into this world. The kind of ministry he had and the kind of ministry he still has today for people who are coming to know the Lord, they turn away from evil, they turn away from sin, they turn away from iniquity, they turn away from darkness, and then they turn unto the Lord and they become children of God, new creatures in Christ. Look at Acts of the Apostles chapter 3. Acts of the Apostles chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 26. In Acts chapter 3 verse 26, it says, Unto you first, God, having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from his iniquities. That's how you become part of the church. Turning away every one of you from his iniquities. Iniquity there that's transgression. Iniquity there that's sin. Iniquity there that's evil. Iniquity there that's evil doing. They turned away from their evil doing. They turned away from their sins. They turned away from their uh, iniquities. And they turned unto the Lord. That's how you become a real child of God. If you're still in your old sin, the works of the flesh, and you still practice what you used to practice, and you still do what you used to do, you have not turned away from sin yet. You have not turned away from iniquities yet. That means you are not a child of God. You have not turned into the Lord, unto the Lord. It is when you turn with all your heart or your soul or your mind, all your strength, and you turn away from everything that is evil, and you turn unto the Lord. That's what it means to be part of the church, part of the invisible church, the glorious church. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 15. Acts chapter 15, you'll see here being called out, that's the church, and then turning, turning away from sin, repenting, and coming to know the Lord. That's what makes you part of the church of the living God. Acts chapter 15, I'm reading from verse 14. Simon has declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them. You see that? To take out of them a people for his name. It is when you are called out like that. You are taken out like that. Out of every evil thing surrounding you. Out of the sins and the iniquities surrounding you. And you are taken out from among the people for the glory of his name. That's when you become part of the church. Look at verse 17. That the residue of men 
might seek after the Lord and all the Gentiles upon, whose, upon whom my name is called, says the Lord, who doeth all these things. Verse 19, wherefore my sentence is this. My sentence is that we trouble not them which from among the Gentiles are, what's the word? Turned to God. You see, the New Testament is very consistent that if you're going to be a Christian, you turn away from evil and you turn to that which is good. You turn away from sin and you turn to the Savior. You turn away from the world and you turn to the Lord. You turn away from darkness, you turn to the light, you turn away from your iniquities and you turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 20, but that, but that we write unto them that they abstain from pollutions of idols and from fornications and from things strangled and from blood. It says they should turn away totally and permanently. They shouldn't ever return back to their idol worship. Shouldn't ever return to their fornication or ever return to strangle things and to eating things uh, mixed with the blood of those idol worshippers that they turn away from everything. Remember whenever you're thinking about who is a Christian who is a part of the church. The people who have turned away from evil, they have turned to good. They have turned away from their sin, they have turned to the Savior. They have turned away from their iniquities and they have turned to the Redeemer who died for us on the cross of Calvary. Acts of the Apostles chapter 26, I'm reading from verse 18 and from verse 20. Turning away, turning away, turning away. That's what it means to repent, what it means to be born again, what it means to be a new creature in Christ, to turn from what is dark, to turn, from, to turn to what is bright, to turn to the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Acts chapter 26 verse 18. In verse 18, to open their eyes and to, what's the next word? turn you see that that's what i'm telling you and if, if you have not done that if you have just been walking the way you were born into this world and you're living the way you ever lived no turning no transformation no touch of the lord in your life there is no conversion there's no change then you're not a christian then you're not part of the real church you're just like you know turn in the church goat among the sheep is sinner among the saints is the people that turn that turn away from darkness that turn away from evil it says to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of satan unto god that they may receive the forgiveness of sins that's what happens when you turn you turn away from every evil thing that you have done and then the lord gives you forgiveness and inheritance among them which are what's the next word sanctified sanctified uh, you, you love sanctification you love holiness you love righteousness you love purity if you have really turned it becomes your delight your joy your passion your desire your decision and it's your destiny you say that's what i want and you rejoice in that to give you an inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. And you find these Thessalonian believers. Let's come back to Thessalonians chapter 1. I'm reading there now from verse 10. You'll see what they had done. They turned away from their idol worship. And they turned away from their dead gods. And they turned to the true and the living God. And then it says in verse 10, chapter 1, verse 10. And to wait for his son from heaven. Whom he raised from the dead. Even Jesus which delivered us from the wrath to come. Now they were waiting for the coming of the Lord. They just wanted to be with the Lord. Now they were in Christ. They were in God. And they want to live forever with Christ in heaven. So they were waiting eagerly for the coming of the Lord. Let's come back to verse 1. Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus unto the church of the Thessalonians, which is in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. As you find Paul the Apostle, he talks about Timotheus and Silvanus, that is Silas and Timothy. Those two preachers and co laborers were mentioned by Paul the Apostle in that verse 1. One. As we come to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 1. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, I'm looking at verse 1. 
Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus unto the church of the Thessalonians in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Have you found the similarity there? As he wrote the second epistle to the Thessalonians, he also still included Silvanus and Timotheus because they were co-liberals and co-preachers with him. Yet, we must underline the fact, score the fact, that Paul the Apostle was the writer of the epistle. Even though he used we because they went together. They evangelized together. They preached together. They went there together when he was going to preach unto them and establish that church. That's why he included Silvanus and Timotheus in the opening verses of both the first Thessalonians and the second Thessalonians. But he was the writer of the epistle. He was the one that received the revelation from the Lord. Let me show you. I'm looking at 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Chapter 2, and we're looking at verse 18. In chapter 2, verse 18, Wherefore we would have come unto you, even I, Paul, once and again, but Satan hindered us. He said, even I, even I, Paul, would have come, I would have brought them along. When he said, even I, Paul, that means he was emphasizing the fact, I'm the one writing this, I'm the one intending to come to you, I'm the one making the proposal to come to you, I'm the one planning to come to you, but I'm going to bring with me Silvanus and Timotheus, chapter 3, verse 5. In chapter 3, verse 5, for this cause, when I could no longer forbear. You see, he was writing to them personally. And this was his personal letter, epistle, unto the church of the Thessalonians. He said, when I could no longer forbear, I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter have tempted you and our labor be in vain. You see the personal pronoun there, I. Chapter 4, verse 9. In chapter 4, verse 9, but as touching brotherly love, ye need not that I write unto you. He was the one writing. He made it very clear. I'm the one writing this epistle to you. And then he said, should I write to you about brotherly love? You don't need for me to write that again. You know that already. In verse 9, for ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another. Look at verse 13. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that she sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. Uh, he says, I would not have you to be ignorant. He was the one writing unto them. Chapter 5, verse 1. In chapter 5, verse 1, but of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. Very clear. He was the one writing. Yes, he mentioned Silas. Yes, he mentioned Timothy. He mentioned them because they labored with him. They preached with him. They evangelized with him. And they went to Thessalonica together to preach the word when they first went. But now in writing to them, he was the one having this revelation, this instruction. And these commandments was going to be given them. I write unto you. Chapter 5, verse 23. And the very God of peace sanctify you holy. And I pray, that's Paul the Apostle, I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful you see, that calleth you, who also will do it. It will sanctify you. It will purify you. Take away the Adamic nature. It will get out of you, out of us, that hard heart, the stony heart. And it will give us the heart of flesh in Jesus' name. Look at verse 27. I charge you. You see that? That's Paul the Apostle. It's a personal pronoun. I charge you by the Lord that this epistle be read unto all the holy brethren. All the holy brethren. The brethren who have been cleansed by the blood of the Lamb, saved by the blood of the Lamb, purified by the blood of the Lamb, sanctified by the blood of the Lamb. Those holy brethren, they need this epistle that I'm writing unto you. Let every one of them read the epistle. Second Thessalonians, now I'm reading from chapter 2. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 5. 
already you have seen that even in second thessalonians in the first verse he talks about paul and silvanus and timotheus and yet he was the one that wrote that again you need to understand that in verse 5 of chapter 2 remember ye not that when i was yet with you i told you these things personal he wrote unto them. Chapter 3, verse 17. Second Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 17. The salutation of Paul with mine own hand, which is the token in every epistle, so I write. That makes it conclusive. There's no doubt, no shadow of doubt in your mind that Paul the apostle wrote the epistle. And as he wrote the epistle, he wanted to tell them and he also wanted to instruct us what the church is all about and how the Christians and the believers how they stand in the church, how you become part of the church. How you remain part of the church. How you are sustained as part of the church. How you become steadfast and solid and stable as part of the church. We're looking at the study today. And the study is a title, A True Church of Transformed Christians. A True Church, Real Church, New Testament Church of Transformed Christians. And we're looking at each other three perspectives. Number one. The church's partnership with God in Christ. The church's partnership with, Christ, with God in Christ. Number two, Christ's provision of grace for the church. He provides grace, abundant grace, super abundant grace for us that will live the life that he has called us to live. Number three, the covenant of peace by God through Christ. Covenant of peace through Christ. Christ. We're looking at number one. Number one, the church's partnership with God in Christ. Let's come to uh, First Thessalonians chapter one, verse one. Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus unto the church of the Thessalonians. Unto the church of the Thessalonians. What kind of church is this? The church which is in God. In God. The church which is in God. That means that their lives were in God. They lived their lives by the grace of God, by the strength of God, by the power of God, by the love of God. And then it says, and in the Lord Jesus Christ. We're looking at the church's partnership with God in Christ. As we mentioned the church, I want to remind you what the church is all about. Let's look at Acts of the Apostles chapter 11 verse 26. Acts chapter 11 verse 26. The church is made up of Christians. Christians are people who are saved. Christians are people who are born again. Christians are people whose lives have been transformed and changed. Christians are people whose lives have been turned around. Christians are people whose lives are radiant for the Lord, shining with the light of the Lord Jesus Christ and the light of the gospel. And these Christians, they come together in a congregation, in an assembly, in a fold, in a flock, and you call that church. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 11, verse 26. And when he found, he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church. They assembled. They gathered. They congregated together. They assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called, or what were they called? Christians first in Antioch. Those disciples, those are learners, learning the way of the Lord, learning the word of the Lord, learning the will of the Lord. And then we're told that as they gathered together in an assembly, they were referred to as the church we're looking at acts chapter 20 acts chapter 20 how does a person become part of that church how do you become part of the invisible church anybody can be part of the nominal church anybody can be part of the church that has a name that it lives but is dead spiritually anybody can become a part of an organization a part of just a congregation, a congregation of just people, just people, sinful people, carnal people, and defiled people, idol washing people. That's a club. That's society. That's just an assembly without any change and without any transformation. But for a person to be 
a real part of the invisible church, of the transformed church, of the New Testament church. How does that happen? Let's look at Acts chapter 20, verse 28. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers, listen to this, to feed the church of God, to feed the church of God. What kind of church? Which he has purchased with his own blood, which he has bought with his own blood, which he has redeemed with his own blood, which he has cleansed with his own blood, which he now possesses because he bought them with his own blood. They become his own, his property. They belong to him. Is the church in God and the church in Christ belonging to the Lord, body, soul, and spirit? That's the church. And if you have not, if you do not belong to the Lord like that, you cannot say, I'm a part of the church. You might just be coming to church as a stranger. You might be coming to church as an onlooker. You might be coming to church as a spectator, but you are not part of the church. A part of the church is one who has been cleansed from sin. He has turned away from evil. He has turned away from darkness. He has eternal life abiding in him. There is a change in his life. He is in Christ. And if any man be in Christ, what? It's a new creature, a new creation. All things are passed away. And behold, and behold, and behold, all things have become new. Those are the real Christians and those are the people that are part of the church. They are called out, out of darkness, out of sin, out of the iniquities, out of evil, out of every form of defilement, out of their transgression. And they come into the Savior. I want you to look at for those words, out of, out of, out of. In John chapter 15, John chapter 15, I'm reading from verse 19, the church. The Christian, Ek Kaleo, called out. Ecclesia, they called out once. Let's look at this in John chapter 15, verse 19. If ye were of the world, the world will love his own. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you, the next two words, out of the world. I have chosen you, selected you, taken you out of the world. Therefore, the world hates you. That's the church. That's the church. That's the church. Called out of the world. Out of the pollutions of the world. Out of the defilement of the world. Out of the sinful practices of the world. Out of the traditions of the world. Called out. That's the church. In, Acts, in John chapter 17 verse 6. John chapter 17. I'm reading from verse 6. It says in chapter 17 verse 6. I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me. Tell me the next two words. Out of out of out of the world you see it's very very clear that when jesus speaks about his own disciples and when he speaks about you as if you're a real child of god you are out of the world out of the darkness of the world out of the sinful practices of the world and you come into christ into god and you come into the kingdom it says have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world for thine the one thou gavest them me and they have kept thy word the believers, the church is not a bundle, a bunch of disobedient people, rebellious people, rejecting the word of God. They are the assembly of Bible-loving people, Bible-believing people, Bible-obeying people, the people that obey the word of God. I've given them your word, and they have kept that word. Second Corinthians chapter 6, I'm reading from verse 17. The people that become part of the church are those who are called out, out of sin, out of the world, out of the deeds of the flesh, out of the evil that's in the world. Second Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17. Wherefore, come out from among them and be separate says the lord and touch not the unclean thing and i will receive you the lord said i can only receive you when you come out if you remain in the things of the world you are not mine i will not receive you 
I will not accept you. I will not count you as part of the church, as part of the called out people. If you still enjoy their sins, love their sins, practice their sins, and you swim in their sins, and you drink their sin, and you eat their sin, you practice their sin, I will not receive you. But I will only receive you when you come out from among them. And be ye separate, says the Lord. Then in verse 18, And I will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and my daughters, says the Lord Almighty. That is the church. We're looking at Romans chapter 11, verse 24. Romans chapter 11, we're looking at verse 24. In verse 24, Romans chapter 11, For if thou wert caught out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, it says, you are called out, caught out, taken out of what you were, of where you were. Wild, cruel, wicked, violent, uncontrollable. You are caught out of that. You are taken out of that. And then it said now, and you are grafted, you are grafted contrary to nature into a good olive tree. It says, now you came out of that which is wild, that which is wicked, that each which is uh, kind of outrageous. You are called out of that, and now you come into that which is good, pleasant. You come into that which is beautiful, righteous, and holy. That's the church. Out of that which is evil, into that which is good, out of that which is sinful, into that which is holy, out of that which is defiled, into that which is clean, out of that which is carnal and worldly, into that which is godly and righteous and pure. It says that then that makes you part of the church. Look at that verse 24 again. It says, For if thou wert cut out of the olive tree which is wild by nature, and what grafts contrary to nature into a good olive tree, how much more shall these which be the natural branches be grafted into their own olive tree? We're looking at Second Corinthians, a verse you know very well, and I pray that this verse will be translated and will be part of your life in Jesus' name. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. If any man be in Christ, any man, if any man, uh, you know sometimes there are some people that do not understand, uh, they, they think that the church has different standards in different denominations. And they say, well, I don't think I want to stay in this, our local church again. I want to go to another church where it will become easier for me where God will permit me to do anything I want. Because as long as you remain in this place, you know, they talk about holiness and righteousness and purity and sanctification and clean life and holy life and restitution every time. I think I want to go to another assembly. Wait a minute. If you go to another assembly, if you're still part of the church of the living God, you still need to have that same life of righteousness. If any man anywhere in any denomination if any man be in christ is a new creature if he is not a new creature whichever denomination he belongs to it does not belong to god it does not belong to christ check up in your own life in your own heart are you a new creature or you're still the same old sinful hardened creature if you're still the same old hardened creature sinful and carnal and worldly no matter what denomination you run to, you are not a Christian. A Christian is somebody who is cleansed by the blood of the Lamb, washed by the blood of the Lamb. And because of that, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. And behold, all things have become new. I pray that will be your experience. Galatians chapter 2 verse 20. Galatians chapter 2 verse 20. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. It says, my old nature is crucified with Christ. My carnal nature is crucified with Christ. My rebellious nature is crucified with Christ. My natural self is crucified with Christ. Those are the people that make up the true church. That's a false church. That's a dead church. 
There's a nominal church. The real church, like the church of the Thessalonians, the church of the people who are crucified with Christ. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. You see that? Christ liveth in me. Uh, can, you can you talk to somebody and then the fellow is, you know, maybe beating his wife or maybe the woman is biting and beating and stealing from the husband and we say, how are you doing that? How could you do that? Well, don't worry, don't trouble me. It's Christ in me that is telling me to do that. Is that possible? Tell me out loud. No. See that man smoking and drinking, and he gets drunk, and then he vomits and is rolling in a gutter, and then he gets up and staggers, and then you say, what's your name? And then he mentions the name, you say, ah, that's a Christian name. Are you a Christian? Of course I am. You mean you are in Christ? Yes, I am. Who made you to get drunk and fall into the gutter? Is Christ living in me? Is that possible? No. If you are in Christ and Christ is in you, there's a change of life, a transformation of your life. I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And then it says, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I pray that that will be your experience. That means that when he wrote unto the church, unto the church, the church is not merely the people having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. The church is not a group of people who profess that they know God, but in works they deny him being abominable, disobedient, and unto every good work reprobate. All those who are still in the God of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity, they have neither part nor lot in the church, the truth church. The church is not just a congregation of people who gather to read every Sabbath day, every Lord's day, yet not knowing the God they read about, nor the voices of the prophets which are read. The church is not an assembly of men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith, those who resist the truth, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. That's not the church. The church is a group of people who are saved, who are joined to the living word, and who are chosen out of the world, out of darkness, into the marvelous light of the Lord. The people who are cleansed and purchased with the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Such people, the church, are the people in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ. In God and in Christ they are. They are new creatures in Christ. Christ liveth in them and their life is seen with Christ in God. That is the true church and they have real union with God the Father and with the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior. First Peter chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 9. First Peter chapter 2, looking at verse 9. But she a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who has called you. Tell me the next words. Out of darkness, out of darkness, always clear in the New Testament that the church are the people who are called out of darkness, out of the defilement in the world, out of the pollutions in the world, out of the sinful practices in the world, out of the sinful festivals in the world. Out of the sinful society in the world, out of the sinful occultism in the world. If anybody has not been called out of that darkness, is still in darkness, is still in the secret society, is still in occultism, is still in adultery and fornication, and is still in all the defilements of the world, is not a Christian. And is not going to heaven. Is heading towards hell. The people who are children of God, cleansed and purged and purified and saved, and they're joined unto Christ and they live in Christ. 
and their lives are hid with God in Christ. Those are the people who are Christians. It says over there, they're called out of darkness into his marvelous light. I pray that will be your experience. If you have not experienced that today when we pray, you tell the Lord, oh Lord, I want to be a real Christian. I want to be a real believer, a real child of God. And the Lord will make you so and make all of us so in Jesus' name. Point number two now, Christ's provision of grace for the church. Christ's provision of grace for the church. Let's come back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. We're reading the second part of verse 1. Verse 1. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Second part of verse 1. Grace be unto you. Let me omit the next two words. Grace be unto you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be unto you from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, the provision of grace. How is it that he's saying grace be unto you? Saved by grace. Sustained by grace. Steadfast by grace. And sanctified by grace. Succored by faith. By grace. It is grace that brings us in. It is grace that keeps us in. It is grace that sees us through. All through the way. It is grace. Let me show you. In Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8. For by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. There are some people that think that you know they get saved by giving money to the beggar. They get saved by doing some good works. They get saved by helping poor people. They get saved by doing some humanitarian works. No. By grace. Are you saved? Saving grace. And if you are depending on what you have done, the money you have given, the life you have lived, and the good things you have done, and the people you have to claim salvation, you'll be disappointed on the final day. By grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourself. It is the gift of God that is saving faith. But do you know, after we are saved, we are sustained by that grace. We keep steady in the word of God, in the life of righteousness, in the life of the believer. By that same grace, you don't start by grace and then say grace is all over. There's nothing about grace anymore. No, it's grace that makes you continue. Number one is saving grace. Number two, sustaining grace. Look at Acts chapter 20 verse 32. Acts chapter 20 verse 32. And now brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of God. Of what? Of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all which are sanctified. That tells us then the sustaining grace that makes you to remain there, that succors you, that supports you, that helps you to abide in Christ and abide in the Christian life. It is the grace of God still. I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. There is also the supplicating grace. That is the grace that helps you to pray. When you are tempted to pray to overcome temptation, when you are tried to overcome that trial, when you are persecuted to overcome in that persecution, when discouragement is coming your way to overcome that discouragement, when they are throwing things left, right, and center at you to be able to stand and stand firm by prayer, supplication. That supplication, that prayer is also by grace that tells you that this is the promise to claim. This is how to stand. I'm looking at Zechariah chapter 12 verse 10. Zechariah chapter 12 verse 10. Open your Bible. And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplications. The spirit of grace and supplication. And that's what makes us pray. You know, sometimes when you're weak and say, am I going to pray? The grace of God will help you to pray. I said the grace of God will help you to pray. The supplicating grace that makes us go to the Lord and say, Lord, I am weak, but thou art strong. 
It looks like the devil wants to get the better part of me, but you can make me stand and you can make me overcome in this temptation and trial that is coming my way. And I can stand every moment of the day and every day of my life because of that sustaining grace and the supplicating grace. I will pour upon you the spirit of grace and of supplication and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son and and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his first born. Not only that, as we serve the Lord, you know that even in serving the Lord, some people say, I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm born again now. You are born to reproduce. And you are saved to serve. You say, but I'm weak, I'm not strong. How can I serve? It's by grace that we serve the Lord. We call that serving grace. Serving grace. We're looking at Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. We're looking at verse 28. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28. Is that grace that sustains us in serving the Lord? Supports us in serving the Lord? Helps us in serving the Lord, strengthens us, strengthening grace in, in serving the Lord. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28, wherefore we receive in a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. Let us have grace, grace whereby we may serve God with reverence, with honor, with respect with submission, with subjection, and godly fear. It is the grace of God that helps us to serve him. Saving grace, that's how we get saved by grace. Sustaining grace, that's how we remain without backsliding. Sustaining grace, supplicating grace, that's how we pray. Whenever there's any challenge in our lives, supplicating grace, making us to pray and to really make supplication before the Lord, serving grace, making us to serve the Lord, serving the Lord more than people around us. First Corinthians chapter 15 verse 10. First Corinthians 15 verse 10, it says, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. That's Paul the apostle. He says, yes, I'm laboring for God, I'm serving God, I'm winning souls, I'm evangelizing, I'm writing to the church, I'm teaching the church. It's all by grace, not because I'm strong. Some people say, I cannot do like Paul because, you know, Paul was just naturally strong. Paul said, no, it's not my natural strength. It's not my natural constitution. It's not my natural ability. It is the grace of God. It says, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God. God which was with me serving grace and I pray that that grace will come upon every one of us in Jesus name you know the sanctifying grace too the grace when the grace of God meets us it's not going to leave us where it met us dirty defiled wrong hardened seared in the conscience no the grace of God comes upon us in a greater measure and we're sanctified and we're purified and within us there's a circumcision of heart and it takes the Adamic nature away and it cuts off that stony heart and throws that away and gives us a heart of flesh that is soft that is tender that trembles at the word of God. Sanctifying grace. I'm looking at Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. We're looking at verse 29. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 29. Of how much sorrow punishment. Suppose him. Shall he be thought worthy. Who has trodden on the foot. The son of God. And has counted the blood of the covenant. Wherewith he was sanctified. An unholy thing. And has done despite. Unto the spirit of grace. This is talking about a backslider. Who has now rejected sanctification. Who has now rejected holiness. Who has now rejected purity of heart. Who now depreciates and who now belittles and who now jettisons, who now makes fun of holiness 
And then it says, the blood of the covenant wherewith it was sanctified, he rejects that as an unholy thing. It doesn't put much value, much worth into that again. It says, how much sorrow punishment shall he be thought worthy? He'll have a great punishment. Because holiness is by grace. Sanctification is by grace. And we're sanctified and made holy by the grace of God. And when anybody rejects that, when anybody belittles that, when anybody despises that, he despises the spirit of grace. We're sanctified by grace. First Thessalonians, I'm reading from chapter 4. First Thessalonians chapter 4. I'm reading from verse 7 and verse 8. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. For God has not called us unto uncleanness, but unto what? Tell me out loud. Unto holiness. He therefore that despises, despises not man, but God. He who despises, you'll find some people in some denominations. You'll find some people in some local churches. You'll find some people among some religious people. They look at those of us here who are preaching holiness and sanctification and they belittle that. They despise that. They reject that. And they think they're rejecting man. They think they're kind of putting down man. They put down the almighty God and Christ whose blood sanctifies us. It says, he that despises, despises not man, not the preacher, but God, who has also given us of his Holy Spirit. There is saving grace, number one. There's sustaining grace, number two. There's supplicating grace, number three. There's serving grace, number four. There is sanctifying grace, number, number five. There is the strengthening grace. Number six, strengthening grace that makes us steady and established, immovable. That whatever rocks or stones or pebbles are thrown at you, you're able to stand. A man of conviction, a man of courage, a Christian that knows what he believes and where he gets that thing that he believes. Steadfast, established in the faith by the grace of that strengthens us. Hebrews chapter 13, I'm reading from verses 8 and 9. Hebrews chapter 13, verses 8 and 9. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. Be not carried away with diverse and strange doctrines, for it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace. Steadfast by grace. Established, stabilized by grace grace. And so we understand that strengthening grace, steadfast faith, stabilizing faith that makes you stand solid on the word of God. Number seven, there's sufficient grace. No matter what you are going through and no matter the challenge in your life, no matter the temptation in your life, no matter the pressures and the persecution in your life, there is the sufficient grace and the grace of God will be sufficient for you in Jesus' name. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9 verse 8, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, we're looking at verse 8. 2 Corinthians 9, 8, and God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that she, always having all sufficiency in all things, may abound unto every good work, that no matter the challenge, you are bound unto every good work, able to live the life that you ought to live as a Christian, able to live the life, a challenging life, a courageous life, a life of conviction, a life of righteousness. Because of that grace, which is sufficient for you, able to make you live in every good work. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, we're looking at verse 9. And he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee. My grace is sufficient for thee. Paul the apostle was going through some deep waters. He was going through some challenge in his life, in his ministry. And then he prayed to the Lord. He said, Lord, look at this pressure. This is too much. This thorn in the flesh, this is too much. This persecution, this is too much. Take it away from me. 
And the Lord said, Paul, leave it there. Leave it there. Even with everything there, in spite of those negative things, you still do everything I told you to do. And you still go all the places I told you to go. And you still live a bright, shiny, beautiful life. Even with all those things that are there. And that's the beauty of the grace of God. My grace is sufficient for you. You know, some people think that you can only be holy and righteous when everything is serene and peaceful. Everybody's in agreement. Everybody's encouraging you. Everybody's looking nice and smiling at you. That's the only time you can live in righteousness. No. Even when the persecutions are there, when the pressures are there, when the painful experiences of life are there, you can still live a righteous life because it says that the walls of Jerusalem shall be built in troublous times. Even in those trying times, tempting times, troublous times, the wall of holiness and sanctification will still be built. And in this church, holiness will continue. Amen. Sanctification will continue. And whatever other people do, whatever winds may blow, whatever challenges or persecution may come, holiness will be the very hub and center of the life of everyone in this church in Jesus' name. And the Lord said, Paul, don't worry about the sun in the flesh. And don't worry about the difficulties you're experiencing. And don't worry about those Jewish people harassing your life, oppressing your life, persecuting your life. My grace is sufficient for you. That's why he said that for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly therefore will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Verse 10, therefore I take pleasure in infirmity, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. The Lord will make you strong. This grace we're talking about is sufficient grace. And whatever the need of your life, you go to God in prayer and the Lord will give you sufficient grace in Jesus' name. Hebrews chapter 4, I'm reading from verse, six, from verse 14. Hebrews chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 14. It tells us in Hebrews chapter 4, reading from verse 14, it says, Seeing then that we have an, a great high priest, which is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold Hold fast a profession, for we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but he was in all points tempted like as we are. Tell me the rest. Tempted in all points, yet without sin. Harassed from all angles and yet without sin. And the devil wanting to push him down into disobedience and rebellion against the will of God and yet without sin. And he who has lived such a righteous life, holy life, sanctified life, he will make us righteous and holy in Jesus' name. In verse 16, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. That tells us very clearly then that we have sufficient grace in the word of God. Saved by grace, we are also sustained by grace. We're succored by grace. We're sanctified by grace. Grace brought us into the kingdom of God. And it is grace that keeps us in that kingdom. All the riches of Christ in glory. The pardon, the peace, the purity, the promises, the power, the preservation. All are ours by grace. Full redemption provided at Calvary. Purchased at the great price of the blood of Jesus Christ. Everything is ours by grace. All we need for our journey from earth to heaven is made available by grace. And yet, we must ask before we receive. That's what we read in that um, Hebrews chapter 4 verse 16. Let us come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. I pray that that grace will come to your life in Jesus' name. That grace is available today and that grace will make you live a godly life, a righteous life, a purified life, and a beautiful life for the glory of God. We're told in Titus chapter 2, 
Titus chapter 2, verse 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared unto all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from how many kinds of iniquity? All iniquity. When the redemption is from the Lord, he will not leave any iniquity still hanging there, defiling your life there, troubling your life there. He redeems us from all iniquity and to purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. Not zealous of evil works, but zealous of what kind of works? Of, of good works. And that's the kind of grace that makes us reign supreme, giving us dominion, authority over every challenge that may come unto us in any part of our lives and any moment of our lives. We're looking at Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 2. It says, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace. Through the Lord Jesus Christ, we have access into this grace. And God is no respecter of persons. And Jesus is no respecter of persons. He gives grace to Paul. He gives grace to other people. And the grace is available for you too. I said it is yours too. Because it says, by this Jesus Christ, we have access by faith into this grace, whereby we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Look at verse 15. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one man, many be dead. He's talking about the way we fell into sin, fell into evil by the sin of Adam. He says much more, the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, has abounded unto many. That is, the grace of God is available for you. And that grace can be yours even today. Look at verse 17. For he by one man's offense, that's ranged by one. Much more, they which receive abundance of grace. We don't have any excuse. You cannot say, my temptation is so much, there's no grace to cover that. My trials are so much, there's no grace to cover them. And the pressures upon my life, the persecution is so much, there's no grace to endure. The grace of God is there. It says those who have received of the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. Look at verse 19. For us, by one man's disobedience, Many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one, many shall be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, tell me the rest. Grace did much more abound. And you can encourage anyone that you are preaching to, anyone you are testifying about, anyone that you are counseling, anyone you are encouraging, anyone that you are advising. See, come to the Lord, come to the Lord. And he says, my sins are too many. I have so much guilt and so much condemnation. But you remind them of verse 20 of Romans chapter 5, where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. The Lord will forgive. And the Lord will cleanse. And the Lord will transform the life of everyone. No matter what you have done. Look at verse 21. That as sin has reigned unto death. Even so my grace reign. Through righteousness unto eternal life. By Jesus Christ our Lord. That's the provision of the Lord. And it's the provision of grace. And I pray that that sufficient abounding grace. Will be available for every one of us in Jesus name. Give me a good amen. amen. We're coming to point number three now. The covenant of peace by God through Christ. Because as you look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 1. The latter part of verse 1. It tells us in that latter part. It says grace unto you and peace. And peace. Peace from where? Peace from God our Father. And the Lord Jesus Christ. Have you noticed that as you read the New Testament, grace and peace, peace and grace are joined together. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you. Grace and peace be given unto you. Grace and peace be added unto you. 
peace. The moment we came to the Lord Jesus Christ, he gave us peace. He's the Prince of Peace. And he is our peace. And it is that peace that has now made us to be comforting and to be comfortable. And we know that condemnation is gone. The guilt is gone. The coming judgment is gone. We're not panicking. We're not afraid that, you know, if we die anytime, that we're going to hell. Uh, when there's any accident, we're not afraid. That, hey, if that had happened to me, what would I have spent eternity? We have peace of mind because the sins are forgiven. The condemnation is taken away and the Lord Jesus Christ has washed and cleansed us from all uncleanness. He has given us the hope of heaven. Because of that, we have peace of mind and that peace is coming from God our Father and the peace is coming from the Lord Jesus Christ. If you don't have it today, you'll have it in Jesus' name. It's the covenant of peace he has made with us. Look at Isaiah chapter 54 verse 10. Isaiah chapter 54 verse 10. For the mountains shall depart and the hills be removed, but my kindness shall not depart from thee, neither shall the covenant of my peace be removed, says the Lord that has mercy on thee. Because his mercy has brought salvation, his compassion has brought salvation, he has also made a covenant of peace with us. In Ezekiel chapter 34, Ezekiel chapter 34, I'm reading from verse 25, Ezekiel 34, Ezekiel 34, verse 25, and I will make with them a covenant of peace, and I will make with them a covenant of peace. The Lord was looking forward to when Christ will come, when he will make the final sacrifice, and then he will shed his blood for the forgiveness of our sin, and for the cleansing of our sin and then there will be reconciliation and peace between us and the almighty God. Chapter 37 of Ezekiel 37, 26. Ezekiel 37, verse 26. Moreover, I will make a covenant of peace with them and it shall be an everlasting covenant with them and I will place them and multiply them and I will set my sanctuary in the midst of them forevermore. You can see why out the Lord was saying I'm going to give them peace. And the peace is going to be like a covenant. And it's going to be an everlasting covenant of peace. That's because Jesus Christ was coming. In Ezekiel, he had not come. In the Old Testament, he had not come. He came in the New Testament to give us the new covenant. The covenant of peace peace. Now in, in Ephesians chapter 2, after Jesus died, after he was buried and then he rose again, we're told of the result, the consequence of the death of Christ, of the shedding of his blood for you and for me. Now he is our peace and he has made peace between us and the heavenly father. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 2 reading from verse 14. Ephesians chapter 2 I'm reading from verse 14. For he is our peace. That's the Lord Jesus Christ who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of partition between us. Our sins separated us from God. Our sins separated us from the saints of God and the righteous people. What the blood of Jesus Christ and the sacrifice of Christ, what that has done is to break down the middle wall of partition between us and God and to break down the the middle wall of partition between us and the people of God. It says he has broken down the middle wall of partition between us. In verse 15, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments uh, contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making, making what? Peace. And that he might reconcile both to God. God in one body by the cross having slain the enmity thereof our sins brought us into enmity against the almighty God and then we were not in fellowship with the Lord we were enemies of God enemies of righteousness but now because of the Lord Jesus Christ our sins are taken care of our sins are dealt with. Our sins are forgiven. Our sins are taken away. Our sins are totally cleansed away and they are no more there. Because of that, there's reconciliation and peace with the almighty God. And then he tells us in verse 17, And came and preached 
peace to you which are, were afar off and to them which were near the Gentiles that were afar off peace came to them and the Jews which were religiously near the peace also came to them for through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. It tells us that it is what Jesus Christ has done that has brought the peace and the peace now walks in our heart, lives in our heart and abides within our heart. In Colossians chapter 3 verse 15, Colossians chapter 3 verse 15, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts to the which also ye are called in one body and be ye thankful. We're looking at Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. I'm reading from verse 7. And the peace of God which passes all understanding. The people of the world cannot understand this kind of peace because sometimes there is storm, there is storm raging on the surface of the sea and deep within the sea at the bottom of the sea there's deep peace and rest and calm sometimes there's persecution and there's a fire the flame of Nebuchadnezzar's furnace burning and the people of the world cannot understand why well, you still have peace of mind rest in your soul it's because of the salvation of the Lord and I pray that that peace that passes understanding will reign in your life in Jesus name and the peace of God which passes understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ I pray that that peace will remain there forever we're told in the word of God in Isaiah chapter 26 Isaiah chapter 26 is not just a partial peace this one is a perfect peace perfect peace we're looking at Isaiah chapter 26 verse 3 that will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusted in thee the people who have trusted in the Lord, those who have believed in the Lord, those who are saved, those who are born again, and those who just rely on God, whatever is happening in their family, whatever is happening in their places of work, they know that God is in control. And because God is in control, he gives them personal peace. He also gives them present peace, present day, not peace coming tomorrow. Not that, you know, you are so, you are so much in panic today. And then you say, maybe tomorrow I'll have peace. It's present, personal and present. And then it is permanent, always there. And it is also peace that passes understanding. And it is peace that is perfect. That will, that will keep him in perfect peace. Whose mind is stayed in thee. Because he trusted in thee. I want to show you something in the word of God. You'll find that peace and grace are joined together. Peace and grace are joined together. And grace comes first. Grace unto you and then peace. Grace unto you and then peace. It's when the grace of God works salvation in your life salvation in your heart and that sustaining grace and that saving grace and that sanctifying grace and that strengthening faith and that sufficient grace works in your life and works in your heart that that peace will also come along but not only that do you know that peace and righteousness are joined together isaiah chapter 32 i'm reading from verse 17 isaiah chapter 32 and we're looking at verse 17 32 verse 17 and the work of righteousness shall be peace and the effect of righteousness quietness and assurance forever righteousness and peace if a person is not righteous he's not going to have uh, the peace of god have you noticed when you go to do something you shouldn't do when you commit sin when you backslide when you are careless and you fall into evil you lose your peace because righteousness and peace are joined together panic fear torment and sin a join together. Look at Romans chapter 14, verse 17. Romans chapter 14. We're looking at verse 17. Righteousness and peace join together. Romans chapter 14, verse 17. It says, For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace. Righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Not only that, right peace and truth. Peace and truth. Have you noticed any time you tell a lie, any time you deal with deception, any time you deal with falsehood, you lose your peace. Why? Because peace cannot stay in an environment of lying and deception. 
and falsehood and false doctrine. Once you go into strange doctrine, false doctrine, falsehood, or deception, you lose the peace. Because peace and truth, they go together. We're looking at uh, Jeremiah chapter 33. Jeremiah chapter 33. And we're looking at verse 6. Jeremiah chapter 33. We're looking at verse 6. It says, Behold, I will bring it health and kill. I will kill them and will reveal unto them the abundance of, of what? Peace and truth. Peace and truth. Always notice that. If you want to keep your peace of mind, the rest in your soul, and the peace that comes at the time the grace of God comes into your life, there must be righteousness. Righteousness and peace. There must be truth. Truth and, pre and peace. Another thing is peace and equity. Peace and fairness. Peace and fairness. We're looking at Malachi chapter, Malachi chapter 2. Malachi chapter 2. We're looking at verse 6. Malachi chapter 2, verse 6. If you are unfair, if you are unjust, if you are cruel, if you are hypocritical, you cannot keep your peace. You cannot keep peace in the midst of hypocrisy, in the midst of injustice, in the midst of violence. There's no peace there. It is when you have that equity, that righteousness, that justice, and that fairness, that's the time you're going to have the peace. But if your life is hypocritical, you know, today on top and tomorrow in the valley, and today you try to tell a little bit of truth, and then tomorrow you're dealing with lie and deception, and you're not fear as you look at life, as you deal with people in life, and you know that you are, you know, you are a partial fellow. You have respect of persons. You're not going to have peace because peace and equity go together. Malachi chapter 2 verse 6. In Malachi chapter 2 verse 6, the law of truth was in his mouth and iniquity was not found in his leaves. He walked with me in peace and equity. Peace and equity. And did turn many away from iniquity. Those are the people that have peace. They have peace and fairness. Peace and justice. Peace and equity. And of course, you know, there's peace and joy. We read that already in Romans chapter 14 verse 17. There's peace and love. Peace and uh, love. You know, if you deal with hatred, if you trade in hatred, if you are selling hatred and transform and uh, you know transferring hatred into other people's lives, and you're going about planting the seed of hatred, of bitterness, you'll never have peace. You'll never have peace in the day or in the night. But it is when you have love in your heart and you know from you, with all sincerity that you have love towards your neighbor, towards your brother, towards your sister, towards the Lord Almighty. Because he first loved us, we love him. It is that love that will make you keep the peace of the Lord. We're looking at, we're looking at Jude verse 2. Jude verse 2. In Jude, it has only one chapter, verse 2. Mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied. Peace and love be multiplied. Peace and love be multiplied. Second Corinthians chapter 13. In Second Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11. Finally, brethren, farewell. Be perfect, be of good comfort, be of one mind, live in peace, and the God of love and peace, the God of love and peace, the God of love and peace shall be with you. Give me a good amen. amen. And of course, already now we'll learn number one about peace and grace. Number three about peace and righteousness. Number three about peace and truth. Number four about peace and equity. Number five about peace and joy. Number six about peace and love. Number seven, peace and uh, holiness. We're looking at Hebrews chapter 12 verse 14. Hebrews chapter 12. We're reading from verse 14. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 14. Follow peace with all men. Follow peace with how many people? Tell me out loud. Believers don't fight with their landlord. Follow peace with all men. Believers don't fight with bus conductors. Follow peace with all men. Believers don't fight with taxi drivers. Follow peace with all men. Believers don't fight with their teachers and their principals at school. Follow peace with all men. Believers don't fight with their husbands, with their wives, their children, their parents. Follow peace with all men. Believers don't fight other believers in the church. Follow peace with all men. Believers don't fight their leaders in the church. Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Peace 
and uh, holiness. Have you noticed in your own life when you cross the line, when you transgress, when you jettison, reject, rebel against the teaching of holiness, you might do it with a bold face, but internally there's no peace, there's fear, there's panic, because you know, should you die that moment, where will you spend eternity? You want to rush back to the throne of grace. You want to rush back to the fountain of the blood of Jesus, where the blood cleanses and washes and purges and purifies and takes all iniquity away, and then grace will flow into your heart again. And the peace of God will follow that grace. And then after that, the grace of God will establish you and sustain you. And you keep on walking at peace with God and living at peace with everyone. And as much as it lies in your power, now that the Lord has kind of uh, reoriented your life and readjusted your life and refined your life you want to keep on living in that peace and that peace of God will continue your life in Jesus name that's why it says in Romans chapter 12 verse 18 Romans chapter 12 verse 18 if it be possible as much as lies in you live peaceably with how many people with all men let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer live peaceably with all men the lord has taught us today concerning what the church is the church is the group of people the assembly of people who have turned away from sin they have turned away from evil everybody stand up I'm waiting for those people in front and close your eyes and pray to the lord and say lord here am i today we've heard the word of god I want this word of God to transform our lives, to change our lives, to give us peace in believing, to give us strength in believing the Lord, because part of the church, invisible church, the glorious church, the church of people who are saved, born again, children of God. Talk to the Lord in prayer and say, oh Lord, here am I today. I don't want to live a hypocritical life. I don't want to belong to a dead church, a nominal church, a safe church, defiled, sinful, dirty, idol worshiping church. Come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Then the Lord says, and I will receive you. And ye shall be my sons and my daughters, says the Lord Almighty. The grace of God is available. It's a loving God, compassionate God, merciful God. And because Jesus died for us, died for you, died for me, whatever sin may be there, whatever impurity may be there, whatever iniquity may be there, it claims that you That's why you came to the Bible study. You wanted the teaching of the word of God to affect your life, influence your life, transform your life, and make your life beautiful. That's why you came. Let's be wise. Let's be wise. Talk to the Lord in prayer. And say, Lord, turn me around. Lord, turn me around. Lord, turn me around. Transform my life. Change everything that needs to be changed in my life. If any man be in Christ, a new creature, old things have passed away. And behold, all things have become new. Be a child of God. Children, be a child of God. Give your life to Christ. Turn away from sin, from darkness, from the world, from the works of the flesh. Turn away from temptation. Let the blood of Jesus do its mighty cleansing work in your heart, in your life. Be part of the living church. Not part of a dead church. A church worshipping idols. A church worshipping image. A church relying not on the blood of Jesus. Relying on themselves, on their own good works to get them saved. Dead works. 
that can save nobody. Come rely on the blood of Jesus. Come trust in the blood of the Lamb. Come be cleansed in the blood of Jesus that washes whiter than snow. Until the Spirit of God will be a witness in your heart that now your repentance is genuine. Your repentance is accepted by the Lord. That now you are born again. The Spirit of God bearing witness in your heart. You are a child of God. And now that you are in God the Father. And you are in Christ Jesus. Our Lord and Savior. You are crucified with him. Nevertheless you live. Yet not you. But Christ liveth in you, and the life which you now live, you live by the face of the Son of God, who loved you and gave himself for you. Let that faith transform your life. Let that faith bring more grace, abundant grace, into your life. When you experience that saving grace, you hear the voice of the Lord, go and sin no more. Go and fight no more. Go and drink no more. Go and smoke no more. Go and steal no more. Grace comes sin and changes your life. Saving grace. Sustaining grace. Supportive grace. Straining grace. Strengthens you against temptation. Yield not to temptation for yielding is sin. The grace of God helps you, sustains you, supports you, supports you, strengthens you. Now, whatever the temptation, whatever the trial, and no matter how many people are falling by your side, you're able to stand. You're able to remain firm. A Christian with conviction, a man with conviction, a woman with conviction. A boy, a girl with conviction. Pray that you'll find the grace of God sustaining. Supplicating grace. The grace that helps us to pray. It taught me how to watch and pray. To live rejoicing every day. Happy day, happy day when Jesus by grace took my sins away. That's the work of grace. Supplicating grace. sanctifying grace the grace that comes into your life all those besetting sins are taken away falling rising falling rising falling and rising taken away sanctifying grace circumcising grace circumcises your heart takes away the stony heart out of your flesh and gives you a heart of flesh tender, soft submissive, obedient righteous, pure and holy sanctifying grace steadfast Strengthening grace. Stabilizing grace. Establishes you. 
You know, the one that is running from pillar to post. Running from flood to flame. Running helter-skelter. Today here, tomorrow there. Grace makes you established in the Lord. Sufficient grace. Pray that God will help you. Now, whatever challenges you are going through in life, persecution, pressure, pain, temptation, trial, trouble, enemies around, opposers around, pray that God will grant you the grace sufficient for all time, sufficient at all seasons. Is able. He is able. My grace is sufficient for you. And peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Peace. Personal peace, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth. Give I unto you. He is our peace. He gives you peace personally in your heart. Condemnation gone, guilt gone, you know judgment is gone. Your punishment is laid on Christ. And the Lord gives you assurance in your heart. And he gives you a new life to go and live in the strength and the power of the Lord. That gives you personal peace, present peace. That you experience day after day and moment after moment, permanent peace. The peace that passes natural understanding. Perfect peace. There's grace in your life, grace and peace. There's righteousness in your life, righteousness and peace. There's truth, truth and peace. Equity, fairness. Justice, honesty, peace and equity, peace and justice, peace and fairness, peace and honesty, peace and joy. The joy of the Lord, your strength. And the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness, peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Peace and love. The love of God. Filling your heart, saturating your heart, sustaining your heart, strengthening your heart. Peace and love. Peace. Abundant peace. Peace, overflowing peace, and peace and holiness. 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 Don't have holiness, we're not going to have peace. Satan will be throwing darts and daggers in your heart, accusing you. You'll not have rest day or night if there's no holiness. Pray that God will grant you the grace to live a holy, pure, righteous life. That's how you maintain the peace. Peace on your fellow brother, between you and your fellow brother. 
peace between you and the sister. Peace between you and your children. Peace between you and your parents. Peace between you and those in authority. Peace between you and the church leaders. Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. <laughs>